Hi everybody, Jeremy here from the Climate Now show on Euronews. We've just been debating how to expand wind energy in Europe and I wanted to share some of the highlights. Now, what's the context? Why do we need to do it? Have a listen to Danish MEP Morten Helvig Peterson. It's becoming yeah. of European strategic interest to ramp up production of renewables because we need it in order to combat climate change and we need it in order to become totally independent of, of gas imports. There are lots of factors slowing down the expansion of wind energy, but what is number one? Have a listen to Carlo Zarzoli from Enel Green Power. I don't think today the bottleneck for wind development in Europe or elsewhere is the supply of equipment, although some disruption in supply chain do happen. And as far as our experience is concerned, permitting and local acceptance are, as of today, the main bottleneck. So permits are a huge issue and there are plenty of supply chain problems at the moment. But what fascinates me is variability, both across Europe and across the seasons. Thankfully, we had two really good experts to explain the problem with us on this panel, Dr. Samantha Burgess and Dr. Hannah Bloomfield. And they were able to talk me through this map, which shows how Europe experienced a kind of wind drought last year. Is that climate change doing that? So yes and no. We know that there was a large uh, blocking high, which created that stillness over, over regions of the North Atlantic. That can happen without climate change, but did a warmer, wetter atmosphere due to those high anthropogenic emissions make it more likely that that high didn't break down? It's not normal. You know, as you say, it's one of the lowest wind events in the last 40 years. So it's, it's an extreme. And for me, I think it actually came at the perfect time because it came in the lead into COP26, the Conference of Parties, where we were about to talk about um, the UK government was saying we're going to build 80 gigawatts of new wind energy. It's going to be wonderful. And I think it was a really um, almost poignant reminder from our atmosphere about the variability we have. Now, the climate and energy experts believe that they can overcome this variability problem with smart grid infrastructure right across Europe. So we can see here that um, some countries in Eastern Europe and in um, the Mediterranean were windier than average. The reality is that there is wind energy generation potential all across Europe, along with other renewable energy sources, such as some of the ones we've already mentioned this morning. So having that diversity in place so that you can take advantage of wind when it is present, of sun when it is present, of hydropower um, and, and manage for it to be active when it's required is incredibly important. Planning and executing on, on this is just so bloody difficult. It sounds too easy to do, but agreeing on everything from infrastructure to network codes to uh, you know, sharing burdens and, and costs uh, when investing, uh, et cetera, et cetera, it's, it's quite difficult to do infrastructure right, to do the right market design uh, and to do permitting. So, I mean, you have all sorts of issues in there that is making things complicated and, and, and time consuming. It's complicated, but it has to happen if we're going to meet the EU's climate goals by 2030. So what's going to happen to wind turbine design? Are they just going to get bigger and bigger? Are we just going to see more and more of them? Well, actually, it's not that simple. Have a listen to Kenneth Thompson, who's an expert in wind turbines from the Danish Technical University. We see uh, continuously growing uh, offshore turbines. Onshore, we see um, a tendency to uh, a leveling off in the size of the turbines, which is natural, and uh, and focusing also on other elements like noise and um, and visual impact and things like that. Those old turbines that have been installed 20, 15, 25 years ago in the very windy sites happen to be very small but very crowded. So you had this kind of visual impact of smaller turbines, but a lot of them. Now, the very same site on average you can install 60 to 70 percent less turbines, truly bigger, but way less in numbers. So at the end, I'm not so sure that the visual impact is so much worse. Um, Hannah, what kind of research do you think needs to be going on at the moment or is already going on that's going to really help us to achieve that, that goal of getting to 480 gigawatts by the, by the end of the decade? The predictability is key. So whether that be a few hours ahead or maybe a season ahead, meteorologists are getting pretty good at this, you know. But the other aspect, I think, is through understanding these climate change signals. 
to be able to work with people like Kenneth to be like, do you know what, the resource potential might change in these regions. When we retrofit these wind turbines, we can make them relevant for the climate they're going to be in. With all these technical and scientific challenges, you might be thinking, well, what can I do? Well, actually, you can do quite a lot because you are a consumer and you can make a difference. If we have more pull from society to say it's not good enough to not be able to buy renewable energy, to not have energy security, then it will become an increase, increasing political priority. You can watch the full one hour debate by clicking on the link and you can find out what's really happening to our planet with all the facts and figures from the Copernicus Climate Change Service on euronews.com slash climate now. I'll see you next time.